Good afternoon, or depending on where in the world you may be logging on, good morning or good evening. My name is Tom Cadigan. I'm Associate Director of Alumni Relations at Holy Cross, and I'd like to welcome you to our kickoff lunchtime learning webinar event. We're hoping to make this a regular series that will feature Holy Cross professors discussing their areas of expertise and research. We have an exciting opening act with Ward Thomas, Professor of Political Science here at Holy Cross, joining us today for a talk entitled Syria and the Arab Spring, Challenges for U.S. Foreign Policy. Professor Thomas holds a Ph.D. from Johns Hopkins University and is an expert on international relations, American foreign policy, and international law and organization. We're so happy to have him join us today. Now, Professor Thomas will speak for approximately 20 to 25 minutes, and then we'll take questions from you, our listeners, for 30 to 35 minutes. I encourage you to submit questions throughout this presentation by checking out the question function located on your webinar toolbar on the right. Again, thank you for joining us, and now it is my pleasure to turn things over to Professor Ward Thomas. Tom, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for uh, participating in this, and uh, thanks again to Tom uh, for organizing it, and especially his technical expertise. This is the first webinar I have ever done, and uh, I would not have had a prayer of pulling any, anything like this off uh, without his help. Um, I have to admit this topic is pretty daunting uh, for me. Um, I was uh, gladly agreed to do it. I, I think it's fascinating. and. I thought I'd been keeping up pretty well, and in, in sort of trying to pull my notes together, I realized there's an awful lot out there. Uh, and uh, a challenge, in fact, has been trying to organize it in a way that uh, won't run way over, provide too much detail. Uh, so I'm going to try to keep this to about a half hour, it sounds like 20 to 25, uh, maybe 25 to 30, and it'll be a relatively broad overview. I will move quickly. Uh, I'll assume that in your situations now you're not going to be taking notes a lot of my students now don't feel compelled to take notes but but you're not going to be tested on this so I'm going to move relatively quickly um, uh, quickly through the material um, so first of all you know I had to remind you it's day five of the reign of the world champion Boston Red Sox it never gets old um, what is happening in Syria well very quick historical background uh, here's a map of the Middle East uh, that shows Syria up here in the uh, sort of upper center left. Uh, Syria was part of the Ottoman Empire, um, which broke apart after World War One. After World War One, it was um, a French mandate in the League of Nations system under the protection of the French. It became independent in 1946, and what uh, followed uh, 1946 really was decades and decades of chronic instability and a series of military coups. Um, in 1971. Uh, Hafez al-Assad seized power and ruled until his death in 2000, and it was at that time that his son Bashar al-Assad uh, succeeded him. Uh, some quick facts and figures about Syria, population of uh, 22 to 22 and a half million, an area um, around the size of North Dakota or Washington State. Uh, you see some of the stats there. The GDP per capita, and I've got some comparison numbers there, uh, just to show that, that it, we're talking about a relatively poor country. It does export oil, but its oil uh, reserves are not anywhere near the size of some of its Middle Eastern neighbors. And, and of course, that aspect of its economy has um, sort of dried up in the last few years because of the, uh, the boycott. Uh, the sanctions, the, the UN sanctions, and the boycott of buying Syrian oil that, that so many uh, countries have participated in, including the United States. Right now, in terms of GDP per capita, it ranks 122nd among 190 countries in the world, and I've given you some comparison numbers there. Well below the world average, um, about a third of, of what Mexico's GDP per capita is. So we're not talking about a wealthy society. Um, the the ethnic breakdown, and we'll come back to this later, we're talking about overwhelmingly Arab with about 9% Kurd, uh, primarily located in the Northeast. Uh, the religious breakdown is um, a very important factor, and you see that about three-quarters of the population are Sunni Muslims. 
Um, about 11% are Alawite Shia, including the Al-Assads themselves. Um, so uh, we're talking about a very ethnically diverse uh, country, and that certainly has played into the, uh, into the revolution of the last few years. The, the revolution started in the early weeks of the Arab Spring in 2011. There were, of course, uprisings in other Arab countries, uh, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Libya, and there were a series of peaceful protests in Libya that, or excuse me, in Syria that were violently put down by the government. And a spiral of violence ensued. More and more militarized opposition, uh, harsher and harsher crackdowns by the regime. A key event in these, uh, this sequence of events was the defection of tens of thousands of members of the Syrian National Army. Uh, which took up arms against the regime and took the name of the Free Syrian Army. The Free Syrian Army has played a leading role in fighting the regime, uh, but it is not the only anti-regime group by any means. It's been joined by many other groups, mostly regional militias. Um, so we'll, we'll talk uh, in a little bit more detail about what those uh, folks are interested in. Uh, so what is going on now is a civil war, but it also has significant elements of an inter-ethnic uh, or inter-religious or sectarian conflict. As I said, Assad himself is an Alawite Muslim, uh, which is a minority uh, within Syria, just as Saddam Hussein came from uh, a minority uh, within Iraq, a, a, a Sunni Muslim in an overwhelmingly Shia country. Um, a geographical representation of the, uh, the ethnic uh, and some of the religious breakdown shows, and this is Syria and uh, some other neighboring countries, I and mean, Lebanon is, is particularly uh, diverse, I suppose, is one word for it, but uh, it shows that there is a lot of heterogeneity and um, that although geographically uh, the Sunni Muslims are predominant in most areas of the country, uh, there are a lot of areas in which the, uh, the ethnic and religious mix is, is, uh, is quite intense and uh, and it's in many of those areas that we've seen some of the, uh, the worst sectarian violence. Uh, so there is um, the division between the regime and the rebels, uh, but beyond that, there is some fragmentation among the opposition itself. So who are the oppositionists uh, to Assad? Well, this is a complicated question, and to say it's complicated is actually a fair amount of an understatement. First, you have to distinguish between the military opposition, the rebels, and the political opposition. In terms of the military opposition, there are over a thousand different, distinct different armed groups, um, with about 20 to 25 of those groups each controlling at least several thousand troops. Uh, the best guesses are that the armed opposition is around 100,000 troops. Um, all of these uh, estimates are, are at least somewhat rough and at least somewhat in flux. Um, in general, these armed rebel groups are only loosely coordinated. Uh, they sometimes fight together, sometimes more or less independently, and in a few cases have fought one another. And the rebels are fragmented not only in terms of their ethnicity and their religion, but also the political goals they're fighting for. Some have stated their commitment to a pluralistic society with religious toleration, while others are seeking to establish a fundamentalist Islamic theocracy under Sharia law. Roughly speaking, and this is again a, a very rough statement, you can lump the rebels into really three categories. Um, first, there are the mostly non-ideological, somewhat secular groups, of which the Free Syrian Army, again made up mostly of defectors from Assad's army, uh, is the largest and most important. Um, this is actually, actually the last one, the Syrian Islamic Liberation Front doesn't belong in there. Uh, this is about 25 to 30,000 troops, and again, all of these estimates are somewhat rough. Um, have for the most part, uh, have for the most of the history of the conflict of the last two years been the most important uh, element of the rebel forces, but this is starting to change. The second group, uh, the second of the categories among the rebels, would be what you could probably call moderate. Islamist groups, who for the most part have worked cooperatively with the Free Syrian Army, but have made it clear that they are committed to installing Sharia, Islamic law, in areas under their control. And yes, the fact that these can be referred to as moderate 
is not great news for the prospects for democratic Syria post Assad. Uh, as a rule of thumb, if the name, if the word martyrs appears in the title of the armed group, uh, and those are the moderates, it's not a great sign um, for what the future holds. Uh, these groups, uh, this sort of moderate Islamist lumping, it probably numbers around 45 to 55,000 troops, uh, the sort of largest of these, uh, of these groupings. The third group are the radical jihadist groups. These are groups that not only seek to impose Islamic law, but are closely affiliated with al-Qaeda, in fact, had their roots in al-Qaeda, and have said that they want to use an Islamist Syria as a base for global jihad as a base to take down other Middle Eastern governments and to strike at the West. Right now, these taken together number probably around eight to 12,000 troops, so smaller in number than the other groups. Um, so it's quite a complicated scene in terms of, of the armed opposition. Now, in terms of the political opposition, these are the folks that interact with foreign governments um, and which is assumed will form the core of any post-Assad government. Given the fragmentation of the rebels, it would be helpful if there were a group that is something like an official political body that can speak for all the opposition. Well, in theory, there is. Uh, that is the National Coalition for Syrian Revolutionary and Opposition Forces. This is formed in November two, excuse me, November 2012. Uh, this has been recognized as the legitimate representative of Syria by many countries, including uh, the countries of the Arab League, countries of the European Union, and the United States. So it has the best claim to speaking for the opposition in Syria as a whole. Um, the National Coalition replaced the Syrian National Council, which was fragmented and ineffectual, but which now forms the largest bloc within the National Coalition. Now, why did I say, in theory, this group speaks for all the opposition? Well, first of all, the affiliation between the civilian opposition groups, these political opposition groups that fall under the National Coalition, and the military opposition groups, the rebels, has only ever been pretty loose. Uh, the National Coalition only really has ever had any kind of effective control over the Free Syrian Army and some of its affiliates, not the more Islamist forces, even what I've called the more moderate Islamist forces. Uh, and in late September, many of the moderate Islamist groups sort of banded together and renounced the National Coalition altogether, said that they wouldn't be bound by any of their policies, they wouldn't be bound by any settlements they might negotiate, and that the only political authority they recognize is, is Islamic law. And again, these are some more moderate groups in the rebel. Uh, forces. So next question, very quickly see a uh, tour of the international scene in terms of who supports who um, in this situation. And well, I'll get the PowerPoint back in one in just a moment. Um, it, is, uh, it is a complicated and well, slight technical problem, but we'll figure this out. Um, the um, the international scene is, is, is likewise uh, a, a pretty mixed bag, even among those who uh, oppose Assad and support the, uh, uh, support the, the resistance. Um, the, uh, the Assad regime is supported by Russia, China, and Iran, or its primary uh, state supporters. Um, and the non-state actor Hezbollah, which is a major, uh, which has been characterized by the United States as a, a terrorist organization um, and is one of the major players in Lebanese uh, politics, is actually sending uh, troops to fight on the side of the Assad regime. Uh, the U.S. and the West support the more secular, non-magical rebel groups and, again, are working with the National Coalition. Um, Several Middle Eastern states, including, the, um, including Saudi Arabia, and probably most notably Saudi Arabia, have been funding what I've called the more moderate Islamist groups. Uh, some funding has come from Middle Eastern states, other Middle Eastern states, to the most radical groups. Qatar, for example, has been funding some of the radical groups, uh, which have also received funds from uh, 
from their private donor network, organized crime, and so forth that uh, Al Qaeda has has long drawn on. Um, so this is the, the the general sort of lay of the land in Syria. Uh, now I won't talk very at very great length about the um, about the chemical weapons attack of August 21st, 2013. That was uh, uh, very prominent in the news for weeks afterwards. Uh, so I'll assume that most of you know uh, generally what happened there. The, the basic information is that, uh, ah, there we go, this is the, the something like the, the, the tangled web of uh, who is supporting who in Syria. Even this, by the way, grossly oversimplifies the matter because it lumps all the Syrian rebels together, uh, which is, as we've seen, is not really accurate. Um, the August 21st chemical weapons attack um, in areas around the capital city of Damascus resulted in about 1,400 civilian deaths. Um, it is, has been determined that uh, the chemical agent used was most likely sarin gas. Uh, through a series of um, investigations, it was a UN investigatory team in um, that confirmed that it was likely, to ser ser uh, likely sarin gas and without being specific, uh, did point to strongly toward the conclusion that it was the Syrian government uh, that was responsible and, and not the rebels. And this conclusion has been, uh, has been echoed by most other actors that have examined this, including several non-governmentals like uh, Human Rights Watch. Now, this was not the first time that chemical weapons had been used. There had been a few other incidents in the previous year, but on nowhere near the same scale as what happened on August 21st. And of course, the um, the position of the United States on this matter was defined largely by the fact that about a year earlier, President Obama had described the use of chemical weapons as a red line in the conflict, um, implicitly um, an unacceptable measure that would meet with a harsh response from the United States. When the time came and the United States clearly seemed interested in and intent on acting militarily, um, only one country was clearly willing to partner in a military strike, and that was France. Uh, of course, uh, President Obama said that he wanted to go to Congress for a vote authorizing military action. It was not at all clear that Congress would have approved it. Um, when in the middle of September, uh, as a, a somewhat last effort, this agreement was brokered by Russia. Um, that required the uh, Syrian government to inventory and allow for the destruction of its entire chemical weapons stockpile. And this basically prevented U.S. military strikes. Um, and this is the agreement that is now in effect. Now the progress, uh, it's a daunting task that is required uh, by this agreement. The progress so far has been surprisingly good. Uh, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and the United Nations uh, have been pleased with Syrian cooperation. The rate of progress so far uh, has been beyond that which many people expected. Um, although uh, the caveat is everyone recognizes that trusting the, the Assad regime for total cooperation uh, is a somewhat dicey proposition. Um, so the next question then, who's winning the war? What is the status of the military conflict? Um, well, here is a map that gives a rough outline of which groups, uh, this is as of the beginning of the summer, which groups are in control of which areas. Uh, the green areas are government controlled. Um, the orange and pink areas are rebel controlled, they're mostly rebel controlled. The orange areas uh, here up the Euphrates River Valley is uh, in the control of more extremist, radical, extreme, uh, Al-Qaeda linked groups. Um, and up here in the northeast, primarily under the control of the Kurds. If you're wondering, by the way, where there's not um, a lot of specificity as to who controls this area, uh, and, and Google Maps view of Syria will sort of illustrate that there are hardly any people living in this area. Um, but again, the Euphrates River Valley, uh, Valley is a somewhat more densely uh, populated corridor um, that the more extreme elements in the, in the opposition um, have strengthened. Uh, a year ago, um, the rebels were gaining ground quickly. It looked like they would win. But throughout the spring of, of 2019, uh, 2013, 
of this year, uh, the regime has regained ground, and it looked like they were turning the tide. More recently, though, they've had trouble continuing this momentum and capitalizing on it. Uh, so as an overview, it's hard to say who's winning the war. Um, it increasingly looks like a stalemate, where neither side has uh, the clear upper hand. Now, while it's not crystal clear who's winning the war, it's clear who the big losers are, and they are the, uh, the civilians of Syria. Uh, some very statistics on the human of the war so far. Uh, deaths at 100,000 and rising. Uh, refugees, and here we're talking about international refugees, uh, people who have fled Syria um, and uh, are now in other countries, in excess of 2 million um, internally displaced persons, people who remain within Syria but have been forced from their homes, uh, now at 5.1 million. Um, about a week ago, uh, it was reported that there's a polio outbreak in Syria. Uh, this is the first time in well over a decade, so there are concerns about public health. And uh, again, here's the, the trajectory of the, uh, uh, the, the deaths and the conflict. Uh, the trajectory of the refugee population, and again, here we're only talking about people who have actually left uh, the territory of Syria, uh, is, is moving upward at an even, even more rapid rate. Um, and here we see uh, some of the areas in which uh, refugees have settled. Um, um, Lebanon has been uh, uh, very heavily, uh, um, very heavily inundated with refugees. Jordan and, and Turkey as well, and uh, a few hundred thousand into into Iraq as well. And I should note, by the way, that that these uh, these absolute numbers of uh, of um, deaths and refugees um, should be. Uh, um, it should be mentioned that, that neither side in this war has fought fair. Uh, there have been wise, widespread reports, credible reports of massacres and war crimes on both sides, uh, which again creates some problems uh, for countries in the West that are, are looking, for, um, looking for a horse to back, as it were. Uh, so the situation right now is uh, somewhat in flux. Um, there are peace talks, the so-called Geneva II peace talks, scheduled for later this month, later in November 2013. Um, Secretary of State John Kerry has been a strong advocate of these, urging um, all the, the parties to come to the table. But there are not a lot of grounds for optimism here. And, and the essential reason for this is that both sides' core demands are categorically unacceptable to the other side. And the core demand has to do with whether or not Assad stays in power. Um, the uh, rebel groups, the, the, the main opposition groups, say that Assad's withdrawal from office, Assad stepping down is a precondition to political talks, and that he will have nothing to do with any transitional government. And Assad, the, the regime, although it, it claims to be interested in talks um, and, and has vowed to participate in them, has said that that is categorically unacceptable. The other thing that... Um, that it makes neither side likely to budge when it comes to their demands is that neither side perceives itself to be in a weak enough position to compromise. Uh, neither side sees uh, loss uh, in, the, in the Civil War as inevitable. Either side thinks that it could break through and win. Um, and beyond that, you've got the fragmentation among the opposition. That makes it very hard to negotiate and even harder to expect a negotiated settlement uh, to hold. Um, as, as I mentioned, many rebel groups refuse to recognize the authority of the national coalition, and there are huge splits within the coalition itself. The largest bloc is threatening to pull out of the coalition um, if the coalition at, uh, attends the peace talks. So it's not a very optimistic scenario um, the, against which the peace talks are now scheduled. What are the United States' interests in Syria? Well, I've listed here a few possible interests. It's, it's, possible to uh, articulate others and spin off some sub-interests, but certainly we've expressed uh, our opposition to the Syrian regime uh, in terms of its treatment of its, uh, of its citizens. Uh, we want to promote democracy. Um, it has been, a, 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 if not a primary, at least a consistent interest of the United States for going on a century. We've got the humanitarian interests of stopping the killing. And, uh, in the war and alleviating the suffering of, uh, of displaced persons. Um, 
we want to reinforce norms against the use of chemical weapons. And finally, the, the quite practical but overarching uh, um, goals in terms of our national interests are maintaining the relative stability in the Middle East. Any uh, description of stability in the Middle East has to acknowledge that it's a relative judgment. We want to keep sectarian conflict from growing and spilling over. It's already spilled over to some extent into Lebanon. Um, and uh, we want to limit the spread and influence of, of these radical jihadist groups uh, like al-Qaeda and affiliated with al-Qaeda that are capable of seriously threatening the interests of the United States um, and its allies. And, and that includes, uh, but is not limited to, threat to U.S. homeland security. And finally, we want to keep uh, chemical weapons from falling into the hands of such groups. Um, so how will we go about doing this? So one of the questions that is commonly asked is, would U.S. Mili military intervention work? Should the United States consider military intervention to serve those interests? Well, thinking back to what those interests are, um, we could certainly topple al-Assad. Al um, whether that serves the interest of democracy, though, is a very different question. The record of intervening for democratization, the record of, of military intervention actually producing democratic governments is not encouraging. Certainly uh, in the um, last decade we've had uh, very sobering experiences in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, the experience in Libya is, uh, has not been particularly encouraging in many ways. Um, there, in fact, was a recent uh, a study done, it was published in a journal International Security, saying that intervening, to, um, uh, intervening for regime change very rarely results in democratic form of government. The, the crucial factor is whether the society uh, in question possesses the characteristics that historically have been accurate predictors of democracy. Uh, high levels of economic development, societal homogeneity, previous successful experience with representative government, the commitment of societal elites to democracy, none of those are, are, are present in Syria. Um, moreover, when we have seen steps taken toward democratization in the Middle East, they've not produced regimes that have many of the qualities that we in the West associate with democracy, pluralism, religious freedom, freedom of, spe uh, preach, uh, freedom of speech in the press, uh, and so on. And, and here it's important to put the uh, the Arab Spring of the last two, two and a half years in proper context. What's more, when it comes to toppling Assad uh, to create a better life for the Syrian people, the post-Assad landscape looks extremely unstable and probably violently so. I've talked about the fragmentation of the rebels. Uh, moreover, just in historical terms, uh, it is a fairly common pattern for civil wars to follow the overthrow of oppressive regimes. Um, we've seen this through the centuries, uh, many, many examples in the last 200 years, including, as I say, Afghanistan and Iraq in the last decade. Now, is this inevitable, though? Is there a way to bring the various opposition groups together? Well, on that front, I would say there's good news and bad news. The good news is that there is, a, historically speaking, a, reliably way, a reliable way to produce some degree of cohesion among the opposition. The bad news is it's for the United States to get directly militarily that has had that effect in Afghanistan and it's had that effect in Iraq and many predicted it would have uh, that not at all salutary effect uh, in Syria. The other bad news is that any unity of purpose uh, among the rebel groups would probably only be temporary. We would probably only paper over the differences in, in the short term and again Afghanistan and Iraq provide an illustration of that. Um, generally speaking, however good the intentions, the U.S. intervention would probably breed more resentment of the United States uh, in the Middle East and the Islamic world in general. And if the goal is truly to decisively swing the war toward Assad, or excuse me, against Assad, small strikes would accomplish very little. Um, the actions big enough to have that effect uh, would entail a risk of larger and much longer term involvement. And this would be involvement in, as I say, an extremely volatile political situation. Um, finally, in terms of the humanitarian goals, most analysis predicts that U.S. military movement is at least as likely to increase the dangers to civilians, certainly in the short term and especially if a civil war ensues in the long term as well. Um, 
and there are other dangers of, of military involvement as well that, that I'll just sort of uh, uh, touch on briefly. The U.S. would have few allies at this point. It would be hard to justify in terms of international law as things now stand. It would be expensive. Um, a very limited strike would be a couple of hundred million. Um, a no-fly zone would be about a billion dollars a month. Um, a concerted effort to, to help Assad would be something like 200 to, 3, 200 to 300 billion, would it be, dollars a year. Um, and finally, it puts American lives at risk. Um, and here I would just sort of pause and, and start to wrap up by pointing out what I would call some ways in which the Syria crisis sort of foils conventional wisdom. One common expression, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Not always true in Syria, as we've seen. Many folks who also want to see Assad toppled do not share United States interests. They don't, in fact, share the interests of other Syrians who want to see Assad toppled. Corollary to this, that if one side are clearly the bad guys, then the other side must be the good guys. Not from our point of view, certainly. Um, another corollary, those trying to depose a dictator are interested in democracy. We've assumed this in the past often is not true. Uh, another assumption, the most powerful country on earth should be able to make a decisive and positive difference in times of crisis. Um, militarily would be one way to do so. And we have vastly superior military capabilities, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we can win the war defined as accomplishing the political objectives that we want to accomplish. And this is a lesson the United States has learned all too often, not only in Afghanistan and, uh, and Iraq, but, but in Vietnam before that. Um, and finally, another assumption that we should guard against is that really horrible situations probably can't get much worse. Um, and there's a distinct likelihood that a broader war drawing in outside powers like the United States could make things worse. Um, well, I've got a, a Many other things I could say, but I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that I've uh, run about up against my half hour that I promised. So let me stop and um, start uh, taking some of the questions that have been flowing in online. Um, one I uh, should mention, this came in uh, from a participant, a participant in the seminar, uh, Joe O'Neill from uh, the class of 1964. Um, thanks, for, thanks, Joe, for listening in. Uh, and uh, basically, he was asking about uh, the likelihood of success of the peace talks and whether uh, the national coalition could, uh, could agree on a strategy uh, that would uh, provide a foundation for, um, uh, for the negotiating stance at, uh, at the Geneva Two Peace Talks. Um, I'm not optimistic. I, I think, as I said, there is... Uh, even within the more secular, moderate groups in the opposition, um, too much of a difference of opinion. Um, and then once you throw in some of the other groups who have been growing in influence within the rebel coalition, uh, what I've called the moderate Islamist groups that are uh, increasingly backed by Saudi Arabia, um, they simply don't want the same things. And going and concluding an agreement, which again, the chances for that are slim, but concluding an agreement that could not or very probably would not hold up, uh, I think would, would be counterproductive at this point. So, uh, no, Joe, I'm not, not optimistic that, that would, uh, that's, that's possible in the coming weeks. Um, let me see, I'll read a few other of these questions briefly. Here's one that, that uh, a, a couple sort of along these lines, uh, um, asking about the comparison between Syria and uh, situations in some other um, states in the region, for example, Egypt, uh, and one asks ab about Libya. Um, of course, these are other states that uh, were touched by the Arab Spring. Um, Egypt was um, seen as really the, the most important and, and the most inspiring um, of the uh, 
of the cases in the Arab Spring. As we have now seen, uh, the situation in Egypt has has uh, has not proved to be tremendously stable. And today was the first day in the trial of the democratically elected President Mohamed Morsi, who um, was toppled by the military um, several months ago. Uh, the military action, of course, not in any way compatible with democracy. But to be fair, and neither were many of Morsi's actions in office trying to amend the Constitution um, uh, to, to basically sort of cement uh, the advantages and prerogatives of the Muslim Brotherhood in place. Um, I, this perhaps is an overly pessimistic thing to say. Um, I think a trajectory like Egypt's might actually be toward the better results that we can reasonably expect um, in Syria. Um, I think the potential for, for, for armed conflict on a, on a larger scale is, uh, is quite, quite strong. Uh, in terms of Libya, I mean, the, the, this is an interesting distinction. The NATO, of course, the United States through NATO, did intervene in Libya, not with boots on the ground, as the saying goes, um, but uh, in an air campaign. And uh, this was largely seen as a success. It was successful anyway in toppling the regime of Muammar Gaddafi um, and in bringing opposition groups um, into a, a transitional government. There are, however, many things that are different about Syria than Libya. I mean, first of all, there's the religious mix. Uh, Libya had different ethnicities, but almost all Libyans were Sunni Muslims. Um, Libya, the, the, the Gaddafi regime had no significant allies to speak of, uh, which means it was possible to get a UN Security Council resolution supporting intervention in Libya, but that is going to be impossible in Syria um, because of its support from uh, Russia and China, among others. The military capabilities of the regimes were different. Uh, Libya, uh, far less capable than Syria, is um, particularly in its air defense artillery capabilities that would make an air campaign or even a no-fly zone much riskier and, and more costly. And finally, Libya's economy was in, uh, it was in much better shape to bounce back. I mean, Syria is truly in awful shape and, and becoming worse uh, with every passing week. Reconstruction will take a long time, and that itself will have, uh, will have problematic, uh, problematic uh, prospects for, for stability. Um, uh, let me see. Uh, read over some of these other questions, which are flowing in quite quickly. Um, are there any points or issues in which the U.S. and Russia might have common interests that could lead to a resolution? I do not think it is in the interests of either for the situation to, to devolve into a full-fledged sectarian civil war um, between Islamist groups and more moderate and secular forces. Uh, first of all, the risks of that then spreading into a regional war that could draw in other area actors, uh, such as Iran, um, possibly Iraq, uh, that unrest could spread to countries like Jordan, maybe even Saudi Arabia, uh, I don't think serves the interests of anyone. Uh, it, it's an extremely volatile. Uh, the, the, the Middle East is a volatile place. It has been sort of a, a truism for uh, decades. Um, but the weakening of many of the governments, uh, not at all enlightened governments, authoritarian governments, um, has in many ways made it more volatile because uh, these governments, by and large, have been secular governments that have sometimes quite ruthlessly sort of tamped down uh, some of the, uh, the sentiments of Islamism. Um, and in many ways, I think we can celebrate the fact that uh, authoritarianism is on the wane. However, it, it, we have to be very wary about uh, any confidence that we might have that what will replace it um, will be a sort of an enlightened uh, enlightened democracy that, that leads to a more stable Middle East. So I think the U.S. and Russia both do have an interest in, um, in seeing a peaceful resolution to the dispute. I think both have an interest in the success of the current agreement to uh, destroy 
in Syria and chemical weapons. I think there is uh, an important incentive that Russia has to be seen as playing a major role in the area. If it can play a leading role in brokering a negotiated settlement, uh, I, I think that uh, it would be eager to do so. So, yes, along those lines, I, I don't think the interests of the U.S. and Russia are, are quite as antithetical as, uh, as, uh, as they might sometimes seem. Um, let me read over a couple more questions. Seems the U.S. doesn't really learn any lessons because it keeps repeating the same mistakes by getting into wars it cannot win. Uh, well, I'd say that's a relatively accurate description of many of the things that the United States, um, many of the mistakes that the United States has made. Uh, Certainly, anyway, in terms of not only the decision to get into wars, but sometimes the way in which it fights wars. I mean, in Vietnam, um, it learned a painful lesson that uh, having the most capable conventional military in the world did not do much against a guerrilla insurgency. Um, it had to learn that lesson all over again in Iraq in the 2000s. Uh, the situation in Afghanistan, I mean, I, I'm, I am one of those who thinks that after 9-11, the United States did not have a choice but to get involved in the war in Afghanistan. Um, I think then the, the uh, uh, diversion of resources into fighting the war in Iraq had results that uh, we'll never really recover from. Um, but the, the confidence that the United States can sway almost any uh, difficult situation uh, in its favor through the use of military force has to be something that we look very, very carefully at any time that the issue comes onto the table. Um, military for force is a very blunt instrument. And uh, it's, particularly if you were trying to use it not just to defeat a regime, but to uh, defeat a regime and reconstruct the country in a different image, uh, there is an extent to which military force is counterproductive. Um, very few peoples uh, react well to military occupation, and that's what reconstruction requires in many cases. So I, I, I certainly think that there are mistakes that have been made over and over, and I certainly think all of them, although in some cases military force might be necessary, I think all of them suggest that, we're, that we should be very cautious about assuming that the application of our superior military capabilities is going to drive things in the direction we want to, we want to see them taken. Um, who is, uh, here's a question that's come in. Um, who is supplying the chemical weapons to Syria? Uh, most of them were supplied uh, uh, through Russia. Um, some of them as far back as, uh, by my understanding, the 1970s, uh, when Syria was a, uh, was a, a strong ally of the Soviet Union. Um, so many of them are quite old. There have been some production facilities that have been, uh, uh, that have been cranking uh, chemical weapons out uh, in the intervening decades. Uh, um, how democratic can a state under Sharia law be? Well, you know, here I think it's important to recognize that uh, there are different definitions of democracy. I mean, one is simply that the government reflects the will of the majority of the people, and the government is in some way responsive to the will of the majority of the people. Uh, now, that might be the essence of democracy, but we have to recognize that democracy, in, as we recognize it in the Western tradition, is a liberal democracy. That is to say that it protects individual rights. And although the will of the majority is important, we never let the will of the majority justify a government in trampling over the rights of the minorities. And that, after all, is what the, the Bill of Rights of the Constitution was in, intended to protect. Well, what we've seen more and more of in the last 20 years is what uh, Fareed Zakar has called illiberal democracy, uh, where, in fact, the majority of the population of the people in many states uh, don't 
want, don't, don't see the protection of individual rights as fundamental. Uh, where, particularly where religion is an important aspect of national culture, um, where toleration for differences and toleration for uh, what might be seen as, uh, as heretical statements or beliefs or practices uh, is not part of the picture. So under Sharia law, I mean, if the majority of a society is in favor of Sharia law, then in that sense it is democratic. However, Sharia law, um, as we've seen it practiced in, in various countries in, in which it's been enacted, um, does not very closely resemble our notion of democracy as something that's protective of, uh, of individual rights and individual liberties, uh, and, and generally e equality uh, in terms of religion and gender and so on. Um, I've been informed of, by Tom I've got time for one more question. Uh, let me see. Um, we, here, here's a question that will uh, allow me to move to my next slide. The question is, how do you keep up to the minute about changes in the region as they occur? The situation is quite dynamic. What sources of information do you view as reliable and relatively unbiased? Um, well, first of all, I will confess that uh, uh, much of what I've done to keep up to the minute about this, I've, I've learned in the last 48 hours. Uh, some of you who sat in my lectures probably suspected as much from time to time. Um, but one thing I would do is uh, commend to you a few uh, resources that uh, um, that I've looked over and uh, have an awful lot of information, um, tend to be relatively unbiased. All of these I, w I would acknowledge are, well, all of these I was going to say are from a Western point of view, although some of the links at the K KQED site are non-Western, Al Jazeera, for example, I believe is one of them. Um, but all of these I've found uh, a very very useful in the in the last few few days and weeks, uh, and keeping up with uh, what you're right is a, is a, a very rapidly evolving situation, and uh, and it's, it's a sort of dizzyingly complicated one. Well, thank you all um, again for participating in this, and uh, and thank you all too for your continuing support of, of the college. It's uh, um, I'm constantly reminded that I'm lucky to teach here, and it's kind of humbling to know that so many people. Uh, love this place so, so very much. It gives, gives me a sense of great responsibility. Uh, thanks very much. Well, we want to thank Professor Thomas for sharing his time and knowledge with us today. And again, we're hoping to make Lunchtime Learning a regular webinar series. So stay tuned for upcoming announcements of our winter and spring schedule. And wherever in the world you might be, have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.